have much longer. Um, so uh, I was asked to give a talk today, very similar to a talk that I recently gave at Boise. And the title of the talk is sort of a reflection on my personal reflection on 40 years in STEM and uh, how old am I? I'm, I'm nearly 56. And so I've been in, in STEM uh, for almost 40 years because when I was uh, going through high school, you had to make a STEM decision at the age of 14 and, and really say, okay, I'm gonna do STEM direction. And that was it uh, for you at high school. So we had specialized tracks there. Um, I've been teaching for oh, 38 years or so um, uh, in STEM mathematics and so on at high school, middle school for a while, and then later at, at university. And it's shocking for me to actually give those numbers. But let me, um, let me just share my screen with you because I put some slides together uh, to help guide. Um, the title of the talk is Now Breakt Mein Klomp, and I'm not going to expect you to pronounce that correctly, but it's a wonderful Dutch expression that, that is something like, uh, what the heck just happened? So this exclamation of surprise and um, literally translated is now breaks my wooden shoe. So you can see here a broken wooden shoe. And I use it because there's so many things, you know, looking back on these 40 years and also now look, looking at what, what's happening at the moment that really have been very surprising to me, sometimes really, really positively, sometimes not so great. And uh, in this talk, I want to highlight a few. Um, uh, before I start, though, I would love to understand a little bit better uh, who is on the call, and I'm particularly interested, if I can get my, my window of participants up here, how many students there are. So I was going to ask you, if you're a student, then in, your, in the participants uh, list, just raise your hand so I can get a count. So all you students on the call, Please, uh, let's see, four, five. Okay, six, seven, eight. Okay, wonderful. So we, we have some students. And all right, so so lower your hand now. Um, and let's uh, let's see well, how many of you are faculty at uh, one of the Pacific Northwest universities. Okay, great, wonderful. So we have a nice, we have a nice mix. Any industry folks? Uh, maybe, it's hard to say, right? When you, you have to lower so quickly as well. All right, well, thanks very much for that. Um, the other thing I just want to mention that if, if you have any comments or thoughts or, or, or you know, questions, please feel free to set the, Put them in the chat. I will try to keep track of it. And uh, Grady, also, if you see something that I have missed, please interrupt me and, and I will address it. So, um, let's see. Okay. So, as uh, the lovely introduction already said, I, I was originally from there um, and grew up in the Netherlands. And got my master's degree there too. So I spent 24 years there. And then at some point I got really sick and tired of flat uh, lands and gray weather. <laughs> so I moved to find some hills and to find some sun. And I first went to uh, Colorado and then found my way to Stanford University uh, right there where I spent a lovely time in my PhD. And then indeed after the PhD, I found my way further south and, and further west uh, in New Zealand uh, and spent five years there. Um, it's been one, it was wonderful also because during my PhD, I got really interested in fluid mechanics and in New Zealand, um, I, I could really, uh, I really had a wonderful time looking at some fluid mechanics uh, applications, which I will tell you about in, in a bit. And then to my big surprise, uh, and most of my life has been a succession of really unexpected surprises, I would say, I found my way back to Stanford as a faculty member. Now, I just wanna emphasize with that photo of me in, in Dutch folk costume, is that I really did grow up in a very small Dutch village. Um, I, my parents never went to university. 
uh, I had a, a brother who was a little bit older who went to university first, but very much first generation. And growing up in that in that relatively small town um, in an isolated area of, of the Netherlands, sort of small town Netherlands, if you'd like, very conservative area, I never for the life of me thought I would make my way to California, let alone New Zealand. But I always wanted to go to California. And there were two reasons for it <laughs> that I thought I'd just share. One was I was a big Led Zeppelin fan when, when I was a youngster, I still am actually. And uh, Led Zeppelin has this beautiful song called Going to California. So I got excited I said, yes, I, I should try to do that myself. And then around the same time, I watched the movie The Graduate with Dustin Hoffman, which has uh, wonderful scenes of the Bay Area where people drive small convertibles over beautiful bridges. And I thought I got to do that too. So in fact, when I first got to San Francisco the very first time, I rented a convertible and drove over the Golden Gate Bridge only to realize later when I rewatched the movie The Graduate that actually Dustin Hoffman was not driving across the Golden Gate. He was driving across the Bay Bridge. So I had to rent the convertible again and do it uh, over. But anyway, um, oh, I don't know why this happened. Sorry. Here, this is what I want. Uh, during my career, it, I really, you know, I really started as a mathematician. So I, I studied um, quite theoretical mathematics at the university in Delft and then found my way gradually into fluid mechanics and, and more application areas. And that was certainly the case during my PhD. Uh, when I started investigating fluid flow, first uh, incompressible, then compressible flow, um, got really interested in coastal ocean dynamics um, and did some wing uh, analysis, fluid dynamics of, of wings, mostly, you know, not, not so much thinking about uh, turbulence and so on. So some RANS calculation at the time with uh, average neighbor Stokes, some uh, mostly Euler equation work. But then when I moved to New Zealand, uh, I got this opportunity to do some work with Team New Zealand through students of mine who were uh, hired by Team New Zealand. And we worked on, on turbulent flows, which were really exciting for, for sales very interesting thin airfoil uh, stuff with, with uh, very intricate fluid flow models. And it got me really hooked on fluid mechanics. We also did coastal ocean modeling, basically in New Zealand at that time in fluid mechanics, there were only two applications that you could get funding for. One was for sail design for competitive yacht races because of things like the America's Cup and Team New Zealand is really big in that. And the other one was coastal ocean dynamics because New Zealand has 14,000 kilometers of coast. And, and so they're always very interested in, uh, in coastal dynamics. When I came back to uh, Stanford, I continued that. And the, the picture that you see right here is a picture of Monterey Bay that we analyzed with, with students for quite some time and build a nice three-dimensional model that we actually haven't uh, yet explored. This is one of the things, so this was uh, about 20 years ago when we started generating, I don't know how much data of uh, you know, beautiful 4D simulation, so 3D and time of Monterey Bay and, and so much data that we, for, for the large part, haven't explored that, we haven't data mined that, but now that um, there are tools available and much faster and better computers to do so, I'm very excited to go back to the data we generated then and, and to do some more explorations. Uh, but going back to uh, Stanford came with a change in topic. So instead of uh, working, continuing to work full time on coastal ocean dynamics or, or sail, sails, I got more interested in reservoir simulation. That was because I joined the department, which at that time was called petroleum engineering. And as Malgo knows, because Malgo and I have been uh, long, long time colleagues in this field, I jumped into reservoir simulation and, and did um, some, you know, looked at some really interesting types of flows, very complex uh, fluid flow problems, actually. I thought turbulence modeling was hard, particularly for these sales, um, but um, there's nothing that, that seems as hard as a uh, thermal uh, model for a subsurface. Uh, reservoir, really, that's the most challenging problems I've ever worked on. Extremely nonlinear, very, very difficult to predict, full of uncertainty. 
Um, I did some crazy things along the way too. And, and I, I do want to mention the craziest project I've ever worked on for those of you who are interested in, in, in paleontology. Uh, National Geographic reached out to me in 2005 uh, because I, I had some experience in designing seals. And the reason why they were looking for a seal designer is because they wanted to create a team of engineers that would build a replica of a, a pterosaur, a pterodactyl. And this picture right here shows Herky, the pterosaur that we built, uh, a, pterodact a pterodactyl of the species uh, Ananguera um, uh, piscator, um, three and a half meter wingspan uh, pterodactyl. Uh, and we built a replica that was about half size and they were looking for somebody to do some CFD on that, some computational fluid dynamics, and also to uh, to lead the sail design effort. Well, the the I of course said yes because who wouldn't? That that, that sound, sounded like such a fun project to to lead. It didn't go so well with the overall project. So at some point, I took over the the lead of this uh, this team and and. Uh, a little bit later, I will mention something called the imposter phenomenon. And this was the time in my career that I felt like a, an absolute total fake because I'd never uh, worked with remote control airplanes before. I've never designed a, an airplane. I just knew a little bit about sails and therefore a little bit about pterosaur wings because pterosaur wings were membrane wings and really looked a bit like sails. So if you want to see me uh, make lots of mistakes uh, in, 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 this, in this team and endeavor, you can watch the documentary Sky Monsters, which is now uh, for sale for, for very little on, on Amazon. Uh, but I was also always still involved in, in mathematics and computational mathematics and uh, gradually over time, and I will talk about that later, got really intrigued by data science. I've always been on the side of using data to inform models um, and also in the, in the business of generating a lot of data through simulation tools that I was building. Uh, but I got in, in, interested also in data analysis. I started working for the Library of Congress, uh, Washington DC, the largest library in the world on their digital archives. They, they were one of the very first libraries in the world to, to start digitizing their collections. Uh, but, uh, and that was already happening in the early nineties. And it was really before the times of Flickr and, and YouTube and so on. And so when um, these sort of databases or the, the repositories ca came up uh, that people wanted to use and, and put the libraries on, there were no search engines available. And a lot of what they had digitized really wasn't very searchable. So we helped them convert this to searchable uh, digital archives. And I would highly recommend also you check out loc.gov because it's really quite amazing what they have in terms of digital library. You can find so much there, including the diary of Abraham Lincoln. You, you can actually turn the pages and, and, and read it and, and all kinds of other wonderful, wonderful things. So that was a super fun. Uh, we, we built some search engines. We built um, some uh, uh, automatic title generation packages and so on. That really got me interested more in data science. So I've, I've been doing quite a bit of work for companies particularly. I haven't published much in that area because most of it, it was proprietary for companies. And very recently, uh, I switched focus a little bit again in my department. So for a long time, I was working with oil and gas companies on, on uh, oil and gas uh, uh, um, production uh, prediction. But recently, I started looking at decommissioning of internal combustion engine vehicles, so something totally different. Um, and in the meantime, I've also worked on things like wind turbine optimization and so on. So you can probably imagine that when people look at this, they, they, they say, what's here on this slide? You're all over the place. And my response to that has always been, you know, the, the interesting thing about all of this is that the building blocks on the underlying all of these applications really have been very similar, right? So um, if you look at um, uh, many of the things that I've done, uh, ultimately it, it leads you to very large systems of nonlinear equations that you have to solve. Um, and, and therefore, of course, you need a lot of linear algebra and, and so on. And it's been wonderful to see how much synthesis there really is between all these uh, different projects, maybe with the exception of this crazy Sky Monsters project. So uh, 
one of the things that that when I was a, a, a young kid um, and I needed to decide what to study when I decided to go study math, it really was already at that time done with this idea of, well, there's so many things I'm interested in. Um, don't want to close any doors at this point by picking a particular specialization. Let me just study mathematics and, and get pretty good at the foundations of that. And then I can probably apply it to many different things. And that's what I've done. Was it always easy? No, because every time, of course, you switch direction, you have this, this period where you're on the learning curve and, and you fear that you will never really make a contribution. But at the same time, I now you know, I really love going through these transition periods and reinventing myself a little bit. And, uh, and so I'm doing it again now with, uh, with these other projects on, on decommissioning. Now, in, in, in that time, you know, the, when I first started uh, at university, the desktop looked a bit like this, right? Uh, that's how, how we lived. And some of you will certainly recognize that. And now, of course, it looks more like, like this. Although my desk is a bit messier than that, but I do have that Apple computer and I do have that iPhone uh, right here. Uh, so the, it's really quite amazing when you think about it, how, how things have changed. And of course, also supercomputers have just gotten faster and faster. And when you actually look at, at these graphs, it's mind blowing. So this was the time when I was working very hard on my PhD. And we thought we were very sophisticated and fast then. And now, of course, you know, it's just, just unbelievable uh, how fast supercomputers have been. So that certainly has allowed me and my career also to look at bigger and bigger and more complex. Uh, complex problems. Um, the, the other thing that happened over time, and, and for those of you who are students, you may not, not quite realize that, but um, uh, certainly a lot of you, this will, this will resonate. When I started uh, in this field, you know, I had a typewriter and a Casio calculator. Uh, my first language was Pascal, and then there were uh, many, many years that I developed code in Fortran 77 or C, C++. I learned MPI, also OpenMP, but I didn't use it very much. And then MATLAB has been with me for over 30 years. Uh, you, of course, had to uh, use MATLAB when you were a student at Stanford University because Cleve Moller was a, was a dear friend of Gene Gallup and would visit all the time. But what really is uh, amazing to me and, and impossible for me to, to stay on top is the very rapid development that we've seen in the last 15 years or so in both hardware, uh, uh, different paradigms and, and also the, the associated software. So for a long time, I could do with you know, my knowledge of distributed computing, uh, parallel computers, with, with one or two languages, but, but now fast and furious uh, new hardware and software um, uh, systems and approaches uh, are being developed, right? And it's really, really hard to keep on top. So I have to be honest here that all this later stuff, that's really my students who know this, I, I have never really uh, become very good at either Python or Julia now, much of my students are using or, or even, even R, let alone Kudo or Hadoop or Spark or, or whatever else is, is going on. So this is, when, when I look at this, when I look at what, what the students are experiencing, of course, harder now for students than, than, than it was for us when, when we were growing up, because there's so much you have to do to stay on top. And I think it's one of the reasons why a lot of students have some anxiety about this, you know, and, and, and you see um, quite a bit of stress uh, develop, at least the last 10 years. I, I've certainly seen much more stress among students, and, and there are many reasons for it, which I will look at a little bit later. But one of the reasons is the very, very fast pace of, um, of change and, and the anxiety that comes with not feeling that you can stay on top of it. So I find that very difficult as well. So um, when I first started, uh, computer science really was taking off. So this was when I was in high school and, and at the start of my college degree, uh, the first time I touched the computer was when I was 18 and, and went to my first programming lab, uh, which was still with punch cards uh, at the time. Uh, but computer science was really taking off. 
And in the, the next 10 years or so, computational mathematics really took off. Um, and, and there were two things that, that really were underlying that, of course. Uh, one was the advance of scientific computing algorithms, which followed directly onto the development of, of computer science. Uh, the programs that I was part of at, at Stanford were all built in the computer science department and then, and then later split off. But also, um, public domain software that, that was available uh, more and more had a tremendous impact then, you know, because uh, with public domain software, people could take software packages and do things relatively quickly. Whereas before, most of the simulations, for example, that were taking place, you had to write your own software for it. And, and, uh, and now uh, you could just take, take this up and, and, and use available packages, be it commercial or, or, or packages that were homebrew from various places at, at the university. Uh, and that really changed a lot in, in, in simulation, right, in computational mathematics. Um, and not all was, was so good. So I remember uh, in the early 90s when I was a PhD student at, at Stanford, uh, we had a visitor from Boeing, uh, John McMasters, and he was a, a very good friend of people in Aero Astro. Later, he actually helped us a little bit with the Sky Monsters project. So it's fun how this, uh, this goes in life. But he was very concerned because he saw that the engineers that were coming in at that time, they knew about packages and they could run packages um, but they never really learned uh, what was in the packages. So, so because of this proliferation of public domain software, there was a lot of black box development, right? That people would, would be able to take a package and run it, but they had no idea what was actually in it. And Boeing really started paying the price for that. So they would hire these engineers and as John would say, you know, these engineers leaned way too heavily in computers and didn't understand uh, the software and didn't understand the data they were analyzing. And something really interesting happened that he and others really leaned very heavily on uh, engineering uh, uh, programs all around the US in engineering colleges and, and helped them, basically forced them with a lot of pressure to change the curriculum and bring back some of that fundamental um, from these fundamental courses so that people would understand that better. Very interesting, and I'm bringing it out because I think we're at a, at a very similar um, period now when it comes to data science. There are some, some parallels here that, that I will draw for you in, in a bit. So anyways, what, what happened was that the simulation research community really also then jumped on that and said, yeah, we, we have a lot of cowboys out there. There's a lot of things that people do without really understanding because of the off-the-shelf software. So we really need to create, compared to solution projects, best practices, uh, minimal QA and QC for publications, and all of that happened in the early 90s, really, and, and they started redesigning education and training. Now, what you saw in industry was also very interesting, because with all this available public domain software, there were a lot of companies that could say, hey, we, we can run this software for you, we can solve these problems for you, be it design optimization for, for engineering um, uh, projects or, or simulation for, uh, to, to, to support those or, or, or weather uh, predictions or climate predictions. And a lot of companies started outsourcing and many got burned. Uh, that was the same with, for example, the America's Cup teams. I remember that, that they hired academics and others who said, oh, we can help you. And then they really, they really couldn't. And so these companies, after being burned, a lot of them starting building in-house capacity. And I bring that up because we are starting to see this in data science now as well. Now, uh, you know, if, if, if I had to uh, define the last 20 years or so in computational mathematics, and particularly uh, as related to applications in, in engineering, I would just say it's all more, 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 more. People want bigger and bigger problems, um, including more and more physics uh, and, and so on, more and more complex. And the reason is they can, because the packages are out there and, and the compute uh, speed is, is out there really on these, on these very large uh, uh, platforms. 20 years ago, there, there was a, a lot of people who said, oh, you know, some of the, 
and, and, and maybe they were hyping this up, of course, at the time. And they said, oh, linear algebra is dead. You know, we, we know everything there is to know. Nothing needs to be developed anymore. Numerical analysis is dead because we have all the tools we need. And now it's just a matter of getting it bigger and bigger. And of course, that's not the case for those of you who work on this. Uh, whenever you drive something to, to the limit or further, then more challenges come up. And I just wanted to mention two. One has to do with this fact that as you're refining and, and making your models, your numerical models finer and finer, you, all kinds of other interesting problems and challenges come up to do with um, with uh, instability to do with uh, uh, you know uh, nonlinearity and 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 uh, response to small perturbations, so that has kept me busy in my career for a very long time. You know, the more you drive it to to the limit, the more you have to deal with that, and the the less uh, the numerical errors that you used to make at Corsa Grid can come help camouflage and attenuate some of these some of these uh, interesting. Uh, properties and uh, and responses. But the other thing, of course, that happens is that your compute error, uh, bound of error accumulation and so on, you may refer to this as ill conditioning, of course, becomes uh, uh, more prominent. And, and we're really very often now, I, I believe, operating on the right hand side of the graph right here, where the computer error is larger than, than the modeling error. And that's a regime that a lot of people just simply don't understand. That's a regime where you have sub models that are coupled together in say large climate models uh, uh, show propagation of errors in ways that we don't understand, we cannot follow. Um, and, and so it, it, that's super, super interesting. And, and um, there's a lot of work for numerical analysts still. It's just a little bit different than people thought before. And it's amazing, really, when, when you start thinking about the complexity that people are driving at. And for me, the biggest example of that is climate models. When you look over time, how many more submodels are introduced? And all these submodels are, are uh, um you know, talking to each other and, and passing data back and forth and everything is coupled, but how errors propagate from one model to another is incredibly difficult to understand. And, and with these models becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, the sensitivities just grow. And, and so the, um, the perturbation studies are, uh, you know, showing much more sensitivity to any kind of uh, any kind of perturbation, and so we're we're certainly not done with this. In fact, we're making our lives uh, extremely complex right now because of it. So tons of things still happening, and sometimes we say, you know, with all that speed <laughs> that we have gained, we uh, just have seen an exponential decay to uh, get to the wrong solution, um, the time it requires to get to the wrong solution. All right. So all joking aside, um, the there's another thing that happened. And, and like I said, it's been so fast and furious, uh, particularly in the last uh, 10, 15 years, I would think, because with computational mathematics taking off and all these interesting uh, challenges that come with it, we've also very recently, as you know, of course, seen data science take off uh, big time. And that followed the uh, uh, ubiquity, of course, of data and even more affordable hardware and software. And of course, also off the shelf packages. So when you look at numbers, it's really mind blowing. So I always put a slide like this up to, to show you how much data is out there, how much data we're generating by the, you know, the time that I'm talking, there have been millions and millions of emails and internet searches. And some of you may be watching YouTube as we speak. And so there's, you know, millions of these, these videos watched. Um, and it's, it really is, is mind boggling, but it happens everywhere, right? On Earth observing systems, uh, you, you name it, uh, remote sensing is also very big and, and we're all uh, generating so much data also through simulation and, and, and it's, it, it blows me away. So it's no, no surprise with all of that data that we've gradually seen this change from what I would call data supported work, which was the case when I was a student uh, where we certainly use data to inform our models and, and, and to uh, use data to, to find out uh, the right values for our parameters and so on, and maybe for some calibration whenever we could find it, to data-inspired uh, work that was maybe 20 years ago where we could already see a lot of data, maybe see some interesting phenomena in the data and then try to model this. To, to now approaches that are purely data-driven. Um, 
So the, this market, of course, is, as you know, is growing tremendously. Data is the, the new gold, right? The new bacon, if you like, or the new, the new oil. And it really has been uh, incredible. Um, so everybody's jumping on it. Um, a lot of people are excited about it because seemingly, you know, in contrast to gold or oil, uh, this is available to everybody, right? You don't need to sit on top of a large reservoir or, or a big gold mine in order to reap the benefits. So there's an incredible wealth generation in this space. And, and a lot of people that are very optimistic say, well, this is fantastic because it's really available to everyone. You just need some data and a computer. And of course we see that in fact that wealth creation is again concentrating in, in very few areas in the world. And, and in fact, a lot of this wealth and the power that comes this, with this sits with public uh, company or with, um, with uh, private companies. But, but also just like before, we have a lot of public domain softwares and data sets that are being generated. And, and so we, we are seeing uh, similar sort of developments as we saw in computational mathematics. One of the things that I hear a lot on campus, so this is Stanford campus, where we're smack in the middle of Silicon Valley, that people say, oh, one of the other things that is happening now is that all domains will ultimately become subdomains of computer science. And this is a, a little bit of a hyped up view that I, that I hear more and more, and I'm absolutely against that. I don't see that um, at all. Uh, because when, when you think about data-driven decision-making uh, of all sorts, be that a simulation model, be that an optimization problem that you're addressing, that's really a big community effort. Huh? You cannot do this without domain experts. You need uh, uh, humanists and social sciences and everybody really to come in, not just computer scientists. Um, and, and of course, the question always comes first, not, not the data. But there are certain areas that I see on, on my campus that I see elsewhere in the world that I see in a lot of companies where they ignore that completely and, and they think, you know, the data is the most important thing and everything will be driven by CS. So I lament, you know, I, I, I'm sorry that that's happening, uh, but I think it's also a little bit of a hype and will soon, um, uh, soon people will find out it is. Um, the, the other thing that, that you see also in this, um, in this field now for data science and, and, and in industry too, and I do a lot of consulting for industry on, on data science uh, integration within their, their company. And you know, they ask you know, what they can jump on and, and what, is, uh, what is hype and what is not. You see a lot of these companies take these uh, uh, available packages and softwares and particularly these, these very sophisticated sounding algorithms like deep neural network, convoluted neural networks and apply them to everything left and right. And I always show them this little picture of baby Bam Bam and say, okay, you know, you're like, a, like baby Bam Bam hitting on every, every surface and every nail with this one big club that you have, which is a, a neural network. Uh, but of course, they're not always suitable for this. So now I'm a little bit on my soapbox or a little bit in grandma mode, if you, if you like. Um, so with, with students and, and, and with companies or, or people that I work with collaborators, you know, we always emphasize that it's just so much uh, you have to do before you can even use data and, and really very carefully think about what questions you can answer, what question you want to answer, and then what tools are available to answer that particular question and whether or not the data is actually there for you to be able to answer that question. So we go through this whole checklist. But unfortunately, there is a, there's a lot of um, misinformation out there and, and there's a lot of problems. So here are some other pain points that, that I see in this field. You know, there's a, often people forget the difference between calibration and prediction. Um, you hear things like, oh, using more data will make the algorithm better, which of course uh, is not, not necessarily true, it depends on the richness of, of your data. You see a lot of uh, work uh, where you have, you know, fandom patterns or fandom relations that you find, uh, and if you don't have domain experts on site that, that really help you, if you've dismissed them and hired uh, mostly data scientists instead, uh, you won't have the in-house expertise to uh, separate phantom patterns and relations from, from, from real patterns. And I've seen some big 
problems uh, occur in industry for that. And of course, we have all heard about big problems related to bias and, and also ethics. And there's been many, many uh, headlines, of course, in newspapers uh, about this as well. So all in all, it really reminds me of what we've seen before. You know, we're at the stage now where companies are again outsourcing. A lot of companies are getting bored and a lot of companies are starting to build in-house capacity. And we're at this a time also where the data science community, just like the computational mathematics community now really should establish best practices. And there are people that, that are, are of course working on that, but also I think redesigning education and, and training. And in many universities that I know, including Stanford, we are actively trying to do this to get uh, understanding of, of the algorithms, of, of sort of fundamental understanding of math and stats back in computer science departments, and also really encourage people to work together with domain experts and so on. We also very big uh, promoters of um, having an understanding of the humanities in, in, in these fields of data science, which is so, so incredibly import, important to understand ethical frameworks, uh, etc. So very interesting time. It's not all doom and gloom, of course, but there's some really big challenges. And looking back on the last so many years, I can see these parallels and, and it's, been, uh, it's been really surprising to me. Uh, so here's another thing that broke at least one wooden shoe, if not more, uh, over the years. And, and it really has been a, a surprise. When I was a student, um, there were, you know, actually Delft University, maybe 6% women, and that included women in industrial design. So if, if you took industrial design and architecture out of the picture, the percentage of women was even lower. But in, in the tech industry at the time, in the STEM field, maybe it was about 15% women or so in, in technology. And of course, way worse at the time also for, for underrepresented minorities. So I'm not talking about them here, but it was even worse. And it still is much worse for them uh, too. But what, what surprised me is that over time, you know, even now, uh, so in 2021, so this much, much later, almost 40 years later, that's still the same. And when you start looking at uh, how these percentages have varied over time, we actually went up a little bit in the late 80s, and then we went down again uh, very recently. So it's not sort of gradually, slowly improving all the time. We go up and down a little bit, depending on how much attention we pay to it. But it seems that as soon as we stop paying attention, uh, the percentage really goes down again. And so over, over the years, I've been very concerned about this and I've really tried to be a good mentor and, and help out. Um, and ultimately that led to us starting Women in Data Science because in data science, this is really quite poor too. So if you look at data science, then the estimates are between 10 and 50% maybe. And one of the reasons why I'm so sad about this <clears throat> is because data has this new wealth and therefore a tremendous amount of power. And we need to have a representation of society at this table. And, and I really also want women to share in that wealth creation and women are not. And Blacks are not, and, and, and Latin folks are, are not, and, and so many other minorities are not, non cisgender are not. You know, there, there's so many uh, people that are excluded from this, and it's not good for anyone, and, and um, that's, you know, that's a, that's a shame. But you start thinking about why is this, that in all those years, right, with, with all this attention paid to women in STEM, because it's not that people haven't done anything. When I was a a student back home in the Netherlands, there were many, many governmental programs for girls in STEM, and we still see so many of them come up. <clears throat> They're not new ideas, but it's still difficult. And, you know, looking at this and also us having done some research through women in data science and, and studying this and talking to a lot of people, I've become convinced over time that there's really one one big problem that we're still facing. And that's the existence of two myths that are frequently debunked, but that still are there. And they lead to what we now call stereotype threat, where uh, uh, women 
recognizing that their women uh, feel that they may not belong and also this thing called the imposter phenomenon or imposter syndrome. One myth is that success in, in our field of computational mathematics and data science is part of that requires, and this is a, an essential thing, a strong innate ability. So in other words, if you don't have a strong innate ability, forget it. A lot of people think that I'm just not good at math. I cannot do this. There is often not a growth mindset in this field. And, and I'm not saying that uh, uh, an innate ability, a strong innate ability is not helpful. Of course it is. But what I'm saying is that it is not required to have a strong innate ability to be, to be very good. There is an enormous amount of growing that you can do in this field. And there are many fields, of course, where people do believe in this growth mindset and not in this fixed mindset. Funnily enough, most of the... Um, disciplines where they believe in this fixed mindset, or so this strong innate ability are male dominated. You see the same thing in finance, you see the same in philosophy, and there are very others, psychiatry is another one, there are very other, other areas where you see these um, uh, male dominated uh, cultures and, and the feeling that, that you need to have this uh, innate ability. Um, the other myth is that men just generally have a higher innate ability than all others, including women, including other, other minorities. Uh, and so, that, and that you, we know that's been debunked, but it starts early. And what has surprised us also with research that we've done with WITS in the last year is how many women still believe in this themselves. So, this perpetuates really hard to break through. And it starts very early with the separation of the genders, very early on, the way, of course, we, we treat them. So, a lot of this, I think, is cultural. There are places in the world where we are also with women in data science where you don't actually see this come up as, as much. So the imposter phenomenon, it really is, is something that uh, we see, therefore, in this field very, very often, where not just amongst the women, by the way, also amongst the men. So it's not a female uh, sickness, as they thought in the, in, in the 70s and 80s, when they first formulated this imposter phenomenon, they really thought this was this only women suffered from this. That's not the case, but it is strong in, in many uh, cultures where there is a minority group. The minority group often feels uh, like they have this imposter phenomenon. So here are some of the questions or some of the statements that people make that, that have this, and they may or maybe not, but for a lot of you, I, I bet they are quite familiar. I certainly have had this in my life quite a, quite long <laughs> and it took me a while to turn this around and make it something constructive and, and positive and I'm happy to chat more about that later. So you know an inclusive culture of course is really good for, for everyone um, and, and we've been campaigning for that for a while and the truth is of course there are so many incredible women in, in data science and in computational mathematics and just look around the participant list today and you see some of my big sheroes uh, like Malgo and, and Donna and others. Um, and here are a couple more. And, you know, I pulled two from PNW, like Cecilia Aragon, I do dub, she's incredible. And there's this young data scientist, Emily Miller from Driven Data, uh, originally from the Puget Sound area. She's incredible. We've had her at WITS and there's so many around the world, right? Thousands of women like this. And so we said in 2015, uh, when, you know, I, I for me, the, something happened on campus where there was, yet again another male dominated conference that said okay i i'm just sick and tired of this i i want to establish a conference that that just promotes these outstanding women a technical conference promoting outstanding women doing outstanding work so here are the three um goals of women in data science which we started then and we started with a really small conference uh, one event, 400 attendees, we live streamed though, and we got 6,000 people on the live stream without much advertising, so we hit a nerve, and we jumped on that, and we as a, a group uh, of three, myself and two of my best friends, um, who've been running this since then, and now we are all over the world, and we, we've got um, over 250 conferences or so in, in, in many, many places. We also have podcasts, and and um, outreach and 
<coughs> excuse me, and the datathon that we run every year, and it's all really thanks to our 600 or so plus ambassadors uh, around the world. So here are some of the pictures, and you see in the pictures not just women. There's also a lot of men supporting us uh, in this. And we have wonderful stories of of women who who gotten inspired by being in in a place where they see a lot of. Uh, women role models around them and 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 actively seeing women promoted and it has also made a, a big difference uh, to me so check us out if if you like at witsconference.org uh, and ignore this um, <laughs> this thing here earlier i said time to talk about education now i say clearly time to talk about data science i changed the order of the slides a little bit and, and i forgot to change these these little notes ignore that but it would be lovely if you wanted to check us out and, and let me know if you'd like to get involved if you're not yet involved. So the last minutes, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about something that I've seen over the years. And this is another wooden shoe breaker for me. And, and that is uh, something that I'm really concerned about. And that is an increased stress that we've noticed, certainly at Stanford and many other places that I've been um, uh, among students. And, and I just wanted to address this, particularly for the students, but really for, for everyone. So he, he, here's an observation, and I'm curious to see if that resonates with you. But what, what, what we have found is that over time, students have gotten much more fearful of failure. And they're finding it increasingly hard to deal with ambiguity and uncertainty. And of course, ambiguity and uncertainty are the bread and butter of research, right? This is what research is based on. You never know if the approach you're, you're, you're looking is going to work for you or not. There's a lot of uncertainty in, in what you do. And, and, and there's not, it's not easy to find your path. There's no such thing as an optimal path moving forward. There's always a lot of trial and error. And as they say, right, an expert uh, is somebody who's made every possible mistake. Um, so we see an increase in, in the number of students that suffer from the imposter phenomenon. I've done surveys for quite a few years. It used to be uh, maybe around 60% of the female students that I saw on campus. And sorry, it's only uh, cisgender now because that, that is a remnant from the past. Um, and, and, and maybe around 50% of the men who said that they, they suffered from this. And, and lately we've seen 90% of, of, uh, of women and, and, and maybe 70 or 80% of men say that they suffer from this. Um, students are also uh, in, in, in um, uh, surveys that we've done on, on culture and community have said things that that you know they increasingly expect judgment not so much support and the joy in learning is significantly reduced among students they worry about grades a lot they they are less um excited about the learning as compared to you know as just being very anxious about the grades and this there's been a shift um so it seems and so you know with with students i always think but why would you do research, right? You're not doing research to, to be judged or to get, to get the grades or to be promoted or to get so many publications. You, you go into research because you like discovery, you like to learn, you want to contribute, you want to collaborate for all those, all those good reasons. And for many of the young colleagues that I've seen, this comes much later. Um, I, I see a lot of the students in their PhDs uh, around the universities that we are collaborating with say that they don't find this joy in discovery or learning, contributing and collaborating with people during their PhD or in their undergrad or master's degree program. Uh, so, you know, I, I've been thinking about how would I, for, for, for people to really for students to really make clear what research is, how would I define this? So we, we talk to them about making plenty of mistakes and going off on, on tangents and how delicious that really is, this pursuit to create these deeper insights and, and to learn from mistakes, but it is, it is tough going. So then of course you, you wonder, you know, how, how come? And part of it, uh, my colleagues in education attribute to helicopter parenting. Part of it, uh, they, they attribute to high school education that has taken away ambiguity and, and, and uh, replaced a lot of the learning with, with teaching to the test. 
Um, a lot of STEM education where students get this idea that there is always one best approach or, or one, uh, one unique approach to a problem and they, they don't get credit if, if, uh, um, if they find uh, alternative ways to solve something or they understand that, that there may be some uncertainty in, in, in the uh, outcome and so on. So perhaps so. Um, I also certainly see in undergraduate education that we, we look at, uh, at, at certain metrics more and more that, we're, that we see amongst the student population a much bigger emphasis on, on the GPA and, and, and getting the grades and, and uh, risk aversion as a result of it. So here's just some other thoughts, right? I said, well, an expert is somebody who's made every possible mistake and, and and of course, when you when you do learn, the beautiful thing is that you always get more questions than answers. But for a lot of students, that is actually incredibly nerve wracking, right? That they're on a in the class where where they're hoping to answer to learn how to answer some questions, and instead they they have increasingly more questions. Um, so so we've seen many many uh, students needing to unlearn uh, at university, sometimes during the undergrad, sometimes during the grad studies, things that they'd learned in high school or in undergraduate studies. And that's tough. It's really tough because ultimately what we're asking students to do is to become comfortable with, with what has been for them for a long time very uncomfortable. So there is a big, big sense of having to start over. And, uh, and to me, this has really become more and more uh, important over over time. Um, here's another thought. You know, a lot of the students that I talk to, or beginning faculty members, they they have this idea that there is going to be a clear linear path between where they're now and where they want to be. Um, and and if they cannot find that path, it's a failure on their part. You know, they haven't optimized sufficiently. They haven't they haven't paid enough attention. They haven't chosen the right opportunities. And very often students are trying to optimize all the time. You know, maybe I should take this course instead of that course. Maybe I should take this internship instead of that internship because, you know, I, or, or they say, I need to go to this particular school because otherwise I won't have, you know, success in, in my career. And, and I see a lot of students locked into this this idea that there is this ideal optimal path and, and that they should pursue this. And that of course, then they ignore a lot of opportunities that are around them. So I often say, you know, this is actually more likely what the path would be and it would be a lot more fun, right? Um, and my life has certainly been like this and you, you could have seen this, you know, at the start or it's like this, that you just go to another goal or, or it's like this, that you never ever reach your goal and it's equally okay and, and fun. Here's another thing that I often bring up is, is and, and I really do think this is one of the reasons why it's so different from when I was a, a student. There are two things that you learn, right? When you go through university, one is <clears throat> stuff you know, you know. So these are the things that, that you really learn consciously and and it's fun right you, you're on this learning curve and and every day you've learned something new and you're going up this this big big yellow slope and it's very exciting but you also learn what you don't know and um that awareness of things you don't know grows of course over time and this red curve is accelerating right? this is getting steeper and steeper over time because of, of wikipedia because of of of, of social media and we're confronted uh, faster and faster with all the things we don't know. And so the delta between them grows significantly. When I was a student, the delta was way, way smaller than the students experience now. Um, of course, also it makes us, uh, uh, many of my colleagues at my age, a little bit more insecure because over, no matter where you start on this curve over time, of course, this delta grows uh, very fast. But it's interesting to think about this and, and to tell students, hey, don't forget, you know, this is this is what you're going through and it's all fine and we're all in the same boat. And it doesn't mean that you lack understanding. If there is more out there you don't understand than what you do understand is totally logical uh, because of everything that's that's happening. 
So, you know, I wanted to stop here and just say that that uh, with, with all of this, one of the things that I've been most amazed at probably is the speed at which things change. Uh, it's making students also very nervous. You know, this is this has been clear. Um, if you look at skill sets of students, I think that uh, what I what I advise a lot of the students is that that you need this agility, right? And 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 then people think, well, how do I get this? How how do we become agile so I can quickly learn something new? I believe that foundational skills are really really important for that. So I I do hope that in the sort of revamping of data science education and some of computational math education, we're going back to uh, really strong foundations in the in the mathematical and statistical sciences. I think that's really really good. Um, and then here are some of the other things, of course, that people now need. And one of the big things I think is, is low risk aversion, right? To really jump in and, and try something out. So anyway, it's been it's been a, a fascinating 40 years. I forgot now. Yeah, so here's my, my email also. A fascinating 40 years for me. And um, really interesting to see what's happening there's a lot of you know wonderful opportunities out there but there is also a lot of anxiety and there is a lot of stress and as educators or students uh you know let's think about that and let's see how we can support each other and how we can support the minorities also in in these areas and i really hope that in your own work environments you will help support and promote uh everyone including those who, who look a little different and, and may not have the same uh, background as you. So let me stop here and see if people want to stay on and, and ask some questions also. <laughs>